Okay, thanks so much, Leon. That was, that was great. And now we're gonna talk a little bit more about topical therapy and really concentrate on the topical treatment of psoriasis. As I mentioned earlier, I do clinical trials, so I have some disclosures, some conflicts. So when we talk about the topical treatment of psoriasis, are we paying enough attention to it? When you take a look at this year, last year's AAD meeting, there are 107 posters presented on the treatment of psoriasis. 65 of them involved biologic treatments or systemic treatments. Only four talked about topical therapy, and only two talked about new molecules. Well, does that really matter? You know, we hear so much about these new biologic agents. We have a new one coming up pretty much every month. A lot of resources going into that. But let's take a look at our psoriasis patients. When we look at our entire psoriasis population, about 83% of them have localized disease. So about 80% of our psoriasis patients really are amenable to just topical therapy alone. So it's important that we understand what, what therapies we have available to, them, to us and we utilize them appropriately. First of all, if you're gonna prescribe a topical, make sure you give the patient enough. There's nothing more frustrating than a patient walking out with a 30 gram tube who has maybe 6% body surface area. That's not gonna go very far. One gram of medication is actually enough to cover about 4% body surface area. If you give somebody a 60 gram tube, that is good for 4% body surface area for one month. So many things come in a 60 gram tube. Make sure you, if they have more to, to be treated, maybe give them two tubes, 120 grams, or a lot of medications now come in 100 grams. As Leon mentioned, vehicles matter, and in topical therapy, they are critical. The vehicle is actually what allows that active medication to be delivered into the skin. And if we take a look at different penetration studies, we can take one drug, clobetazole propionate, and put it in different vehicles and look at the penetration. And basically we find that um, it matters a lot. Here we look at clobetazole in a foam. We saw great penetration. And then when we look at it, for, for instance, in a lotion, it's much less. Some of the sprays and the foam formulations really allow us to get enhanced penetration. And the efficacy generally correlates with that. As Leon mentioned, you change the vehicle, you change the potency. Say one of your patients is using mometazone and they're using the ointment formulation. Well, that's a high potency category. But say they say they don't like the ointments, they wanna to switch to a cream and you think, okay, fine. No problem, I'll write mometazone and instead of the ointment, here's the cream, you might like that better. Well, they might like it better, but you have to realize that you're now compromising the efficacy because to take that steroid ointment and switch it to the steroid cream, we actually now jump down two different classifications and now we're in more of a mid-potency range. So just realize different vehicles make a, a major difference. Using topical vitamin D, I alluded to this earlier. Vitamin D ointment works fairly well for the treatment of psoriasis. Switch that to a cream, it works some. Switch that to a lotion, a solution, it works a touch. So there it's very, really, really dependent on which vehicle you um, add that, that active. There was a nice write-up that was done that actually scoured the literature to look at how much evidence do we have for each of the treatments of psoriasis. And basically they gave the top treatments an A. So the things that have the best research behind them to say, you know what, this really does work for psoriasis, include topical steroids, uh, uh, and especially the, the, the uh, potent and superpotent steroids, vitamin D analogs, tazeratine or vitamin A, and then the combination of steroid and vitamin D analogs and steroid and tazeratine. So those are the only things that actually got the A rating or the, the, the best literature, the best data to support efficacy. Let's start by talking about topical steroids. These work great. You give somebody a potent topical steroid with a good vehicle, there is nothing that's gonna get your patient under control faster than a really good steroid. Here's a patient that a before and after using clobetazole spray, and we see we can get that patient under control very, very quickly. Do we have to worry about steroid side effects? We hear about them, how real are they? Well, when we take a look, first of all, at steroid atrophy, we want to know how much does it thin the skin. When you look at the package insert of our super potent steroids, um, including the clobetazole spray, which is 
which is a super potent, even our new one, newer uh, spray, desoxymethasone spray. These are very good topical steroids with good efficacy. When we look at the package inserts, we don't see atrophy is mentioned hardly at all. Very, very rare to see it in a package insert. And I do these studies. Do you think when we're documenting whether atrophy exists or not, we do like an ultrasound or a biopsy there and we say yes or no, is there atrophy in these studies? No, we go like this, we go, yeah, that looks good. Okay, no atrophy. So, you know, we're, we're not really looking for it, so it's not really documented that we say it's not there. But if you actually look for it, you do a study and you say, is there atrophy, you're gonna find it. Here's a study looking at clobetazole over time, treating in um, healthy women. And what we find is, guess what? It thins out the epidermis. It thins it out at two weeks, it thins it out at four weeks. But the good news is, if you stop using the medicine, the atrophy reverses. And we see that you stop using it and it's, the skin thickens up on its own. That's good news. What about the dermis? If you look for it, you're gonna find it. Treating with topical clobetazole, we thin out the skin, we, skin out the derma, we thin out the dermis, but guess what? You stop using it, it thickens up. Has anybody given somebody a steroid injection for an acne cyst and maybe went a little bit wild with it and they got a little divot there? Guess what? The good news is it, it, it reverses with time. You don't have to worry about it. That's true for atrophy, it's not true for striae. If you induce striae, it is a permanent change. So that's not what we want to see. But you know that atrophy will reverse. Well, say we want to prevent it. I know it can reverse, but I don't want atrophy. I want to do whatever I can not to get my patient's skin thinned out because there are problems. It's more fragile, it, it breaks, they hit something, it bleeds. Well, there have been studies that have been done that look at combining different agents together to see whether or not we can minimize the atrophy while still maintaining the efficacy. The first study looked at ammonium lactate. And they looked at basically ammonium lactate alone actually thickens the skin by itself. Steroid thin the skin. And they found that when they used the two of these together, they actually found that atrophy occurred um, with less severity, about 19% reduction in the atrophy in the epidermis. And uh, this was shown also with biopsy specimens that you could reduce the potential atrophy. Tazeratine gel was also studied in combination with topical steroids. Again, if you use tazeratine by itself, you thicken up the skin by about 62%. If you use steroid by itself, you thin the skin by about 43%. If you use to get the two together, you could reduce the atrophy by about 37%. So the two of them worked fairly nicely together. And finally, uh, vitamin D, calcipotriene with steroid, very similar results. If you look at untreated patients, here they are. Vehicle, here they are. Beta, uh, beta methasone dipropionate, uh, a strong steroid, thins out the skin. Calcipotriene thickened it up a bit. And then when you use the two together, at least in an animal model, you were able to significantly minimize the risk of atrophy. What about HPA axis suppression? We hear about it. Is that something we need to worry about? Well, you know if you treat somebody with a topical steroid and you do an HPA axis suppression study, you're gonna see laboratory evidence of HPA axis suppression. Is that clinically meaningful? Well, there were two large reviews that were done. The first one looked at 21 years of studies using short-term, long-term potent topical steroids. And you know what they found? There was no evidence of pathologic HPA axis suppression in any of the patients, even when they treated large body surface areas and the scalp. The second review that was done that was published this year found that there was one single clinical trial that there were reports of pathologic adrenal suppression. But in this case, those patients used more than about twice the recommended amount of medication, and they used the drug for as long as 18 months. So you abuse it, you can push it, you can get pathologically significant HP axis suppression, but if you use it with, uh, along the appropriate guidelines, this is not something you should really worry about. What about pregnancy? Can we use steroids, especially potent steroids in pregnant women? And this was a study that was done out of the UK with 35,000 pregnant women. And they analyzed those who had been exposed to steroids anywhere or from their last menstrual period all the way through delivery. The good news is, they found no association between topical steroids and oral facial cleft palate or cleft lip, no fetal death. 
but they did find that there was a dose uh, dependent relationship between potent and very potent steroids and fetal growth retardation. For every extra 30 grams that they used, there was an increased risk of fetal growth restriction. So it's not death, it's not congenital abnormalities. We usually try to stay with the lower potency steroids in our pregnant patients. Okay, you got that patient, you used some good medicines, you got them under control, they're good now. Now what? You used a topical steroid, you got them under control, should we stop? Well, the question is, did you cure them? I don't think so. You got them under control, but just like acne, we didn't cure them. So what am I supposed to do? The studies went for two weeks, four weeks, maybe a little bit longer. What am I supposed to do now with my patient? Well, here are some studies that actually looked at some form of maintenance. The first study used uh, beta-methasone dipropionate ointment twice a day for two to three weeks, and then they had patients who, once they got into remission, use it only on weekends versus using vehicle on weekends, and they found that if you just did that pulse maintenance therapy, you're able to maintain remission in 74% of patients versus just 21% who use vehicle alone. Another study using clobetazole for two weeks and trying to, again, maintain remission by just twice weekly dosing found that in 75% they were able to maintain that remission meaning treat even the areas that are clear, trying to keep that disease from coming back. This was also studied in atopic dermatitis, looking at children and adults with moderate to severe atopic dermatitis. Get that patient under control with a fluticasone propionate. Then after they were fairly clear, taper to just twice a week. And here we saw that seven to eight times more likely to prevent relapse if you use just that pulse dosing. Let's switch gears and talk a little bit about vitamin D. And it's always interesting when we find a good result totally by accident. And that's what happened here with vitamin D and psoriasis. This was a woman actually in Japan who was being treated for her osteoporosis with systemic vitamin D and her psoriasis cleared. So it was interesting now that we, we look at the effect of vitamin D on psoriasis and we know, actually we hear about vitamin D with so many things. Everybody, vitamin D is all the rage. Well, in psoriasis, we know it has some very important effects. It actually decreases the inflammation in the skin. It inhibit, inhibits keratinocyte proliferation or production. We know that normal skin, it might take 30 days for a cell to go from the basal layer all the way up through the stratum corneum. In psoriasis, it goes crazy. These cells are going buh, 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 buh. They're, they're going very, very quickly from the basal layer all the way up through the stratum corneum. But you know, the same cell in the basal layer is not the same cell in the granular layer in the stratum of corneum. They have to have an educational process as they make their way up through the skin. They have to be schooled. Well, you can imagine if the cell is replicating that quickly, they're not being schooled appropriately. So there's abnormal differentiation. The cells are not differentiated appropriately, and vitamin D helps to differentiate or school those cells the way they're supposed to. If you take a look at a biopsy of psoriasis skin and look for measures of differentiation, notice we don't see any staining. If you treat with vitamin D for four weeks and then stain again, we see that the, the cells have now been schooled. They've learned how to differentiate appropriately, and now we have an appropriate granular layer that's formed. So it helps to promote differentiation. So let's go back to that potent topical steroid. The skin got really nicely clear. It looked beautiful. But is it truly clear? Well, when you actually take a biopsy from, from the areas of, of uh, skin treated with topical steroids, it's not necessarily completely clear under the skin. Sometimes it still has some, some abnormal differentiation. We know that when we use vitamin D in conjunction with topical steroids, a lot of good benefits occur. So first of all, we know that the vitamin D is a slow actor. It, it comes in it's kind of slow to get itself going because you think about it, it's going into the nuclei, it's reprogramming those cells to do the right thing, to go to school, to differentiate, to stop replicating so quickly. But with topical steroids, there's also some collateral damage. They get those cells, that skin under control, but they also do some not so great things. When we use potent topical steroids, we actually cause a problem with the permeability barrier and also with the stratum corneum integrity. So topical steroids actually prevents lipid synthesis, and so they, they create a, a problem with the uh, permeability barrier of the skin. If you take vitamin D and use it in conjunction with topical steroids, the vitamin D actually 
allows those, those lipids to be synthesized appropriately. And so using the two together, we actually repair that permeability barrier and prevent the uh, increase in transepidermal water loss. Vitamin D, though, is a little bit fickle. It doesn't play well with others. If you put it with anything that's acidic, you will inactivate it. If you put it with light, either UVA, UVB, it will get inactivated. So you have to be very careful about utilizing it. This was a study that was done by Dr. Lubwall and others in uh, the 1990s, actually, looking to see if you put those two, so it makes sense to use them together, but practically does it make any difference. Here they utilized a combination of a potent topical steroid ointment and a vitamin D ointment using each once a day. Compare that to potent topical steroid twice a day or vitamin D alone twice a day. And what they found was that by using half the amount of steroids and adding in the vitamin D, not only did they get better efficacy, but they actually used half as much topical steroid. So this really became the way we use topical therapy. This was kind of the menu that, that dermatologists use for psoriasis. There is a fixed combination that's available, and now in the fixed combination, again, they found that by utilizing the two together in a fixed combination, it was statistically better than the steroid, the vitamin D, or the vehicle. There was recently a meta-analysis that was published that looked at all the data surrounding using a vitamin D analog with a potent steroid, and what they found was that if you use a class one or a class two potent steroid with a vitamin D, you got better efficacy than the vitamin D than using the potent steroid alone. So there is a lot of data that suggests this really is a good combination. What about tazeratine? We don't think about tazeratine so much for psoriasis. We think about it for acne, but it is absolutely FDA approved in both concentrations for the treatment of psoriasis. It's a topical retinoid and it does have a little bit of baggage with it. It's a pregnancy category X. So if you read the package insert, it will suggest that you have a negative pregnancy test before you start anybody on tazeratine. And that's true for acne or psoriasis. One of the issues when treating with psori for psoriasis is it can be irritating. So often we'll utilize a topical steroid in conjunction with the tazeratine, and by doing that, we actually minimize the side effects, but we also push the efficacy up. So here's tazeratine with a uh, vehicle, and then if we add a potent or super potent steroid, we can really get quite nice results. But you know, using it as monotherapy can be a little bit tough because of the irritation. What about tar? Tar is not really embraced so much here in the United States, but it has a very long history. Um, it goes back to the 1920s where the Geckerman treatment was utilized quite a bit. That's using tar and light and getting these patients and using wet wraps. You could actually get a patient under control pretty cl well, 90% clearance in 18 days. And the good news is there was a very long durable effect. These patients would go eight months without a relapse. Who's going to use tar? I mean, who is honestly going to take out some sloppy tar and put it on, and it smells, and it stains, and it's gooey? Well, we do have some new formulations. We have a, uh, a solution and a foam formulation that actually work quite well. This was a study utilizing the topical tar solution alone for the treatment of psoriasis, and we see that basically 12 weeks, patient got fairly good control, and then they're off therapy for uh, six weeks and they still don't have any relapse. So it's something we can think about. Is it safe? There's a lot of chatter about tar causing cancer. This was a study that was published in the JID, looking at over 13,000 patients who were treated with tar for psoriasis and eczema. And the bottom line of this study was they did not see an increased risk of uh, systemic or uh, cutaneous malignancies. So one study that shows that still the, some people do worry about it. Okay, so here's a woman that comes in and she's got this really bad intertrigo, not getting better. If somebody comes in like that, take a look at the rest of their skin. Is it intertrigo or is it inverse psoriasis? This can be very difficult to treat. Somebody who has psoriasis on their face, under the breasts, in the groin, under the arms, what are you gonna do? you're probably not gonna take out a potent topical steroid and put it there because we have the risk of atrophy and maybe striae. Well, this is a place where you can certainly think about vitamin D. And actually, vitamin D um, calcitriol as opposed to calcipatriene was actually more effective and less irritating than the calcipatriene ointment. 
So in conclusion, I think we have a lot of really good treatments for the topical therapy of psoriasis. We shouldn't ignore this. The vast number of our patients really are using topical therapy alone. Think about tazeratine, revisit TAR, and we have a lot of new molecules on the horizon. Thank you.